Good morning, and thank you so much for joining me. Well, before I introduce this morning's guest, I want to thank all the volunteers who helped Rebuilding Together Greater Dallas this past Friday, September 11th, for the National Day of Service and Remembrance. There were volunteers across the Metroplex helping veterans and senior citizens with home projects to make their homes livable. We helped out at the home of Mr. James Hurst in Dallas, a veteran of World War II and Korea, and it was an honor to be of service to him. Now, coming up over the next couple of weeks, we have several events that we will be involved with. On Saturday, September 19th, we'll be out at the American Airlines Center for the St. Jude Run Walk to End Childhood Cancer. And then the following Saturday, September 26th, we're going to be at the American Airlines Center once again for the Walk to End Alzheimer's. And if you or someone you know has been affected by pediatric cancer or by Alzheimer's, as my family has been, then we invite you to join us at one or both of these events. Joining me in studio this morning for the first segment of our program, Dr. Diana Kerwin. She is an Alzheimer's Association board member and chief of geriatrics at Texas Health Resources Presbyterian. She is also the founder of Texas Alzheimer's and Memory Disorders. Also in studio, Veronica Shanklin, who I met at last year's Walk to End Alzheimer's in Dallas. Veronica is a caregiver for her mother and her grandmother, both who are suffering from Alzheimer's. Dr. Kerwin, Veronica, welcome to the program. Thank Thank you. you. Dr. Kerwin, I'm going to start with you. As someone who treats people with Alzheimer's, what is it that you want the general public to know about this disease? The first thing that has struck me since I've been doing this for about 15 years, taking care of of persons with Alzheimer's disease, making the diagnosis and setting the treatment plan and then meeting with the patient and the family about every six months to go over the medical side of it, is how often things come up in in between those six months visits that they didn't go get any help and didn't realize that there's others that are going through this and that you're not always going to know what to do when uh, something arises with Alzheimer's disease. There are some common threads, but there's things that I can't ever predict that might happen that we'll, we'll probably talk about. But the one thing is to reach out to the resources that we have in the community. The Alzheimer's Association is definitely set up to help you on the day and the moment that you need it. There's helplines, there's staff there to help you, and then there's other programs that if you find out about them, it does make it a bit easier for the person affected and for the families, too. I was so fortunate when my mom was diagnosed that I already knew about the Alzheimer's Association. I was very familiar with them, so I immediately reached out to the helpline because I needed help navigating this disease or even dealing with my guilt over things, of losing patience. So that's one thing that I really want people to know is if you receive a diagnosis, if someone that you love, someone in your family receives that diagnosis of Alzheimer's, is immediately reach out because the resources are going to be so valuable. ALZ.org is the Alzheimer's Association website, and then you can find a local chapter for you. What are the warning signs that people should be on the lookout for, Dr. Kerwin, before getting a diagnosis? Well, the majority of the cases of Alzheimer's disease usually occur after age 65. And after age 65, there is some normal slowing of our processing speed. So not remembering the name of that actor in the movie might take a little while to remember someone's name, but they should still come to you and not interfere with your daily activities that you do. When memory loss starts to affect your ability to take your medications or remember appointments, that's when it's a sign that it needs to be looked into. Not all memory loss is Alzheimer's disease. There are other things that can cause memory loss. So it's important to have a medical evaluation as that initial diagnosis. But also um, what happens a lot of times, which is one of the biggest challenges with Alzheimer's disease as opposed to other diseases, is the person affected is often the least aware of the changes. They don't realize that they're forgetting because the people around them are kind of going, hmm, mom doesn't realize that we talked about that or I'll remind her again, but she still doesn't remember that we talked about it. And the people around them usually notice it. So For most of us, actually, when we notice that someone's declining, that's the more common reason that someone makes an appointment is their daughter, their husband, their wife, their good friend said, I think you're losing, you're having some trouble. Let's go see your doctor. Is there a test that will let people know that they are having early onset Alzheimer's or that they have Alzheimer's? So the first thing is a really thorough examination. There are some memory tests that doctors can do in the office that just kind of give them an idea of if you're not scoring quite as well as you should be, but it doesn't really tell them why. That really comes from doing a full evaluation of looking at medications, at blood work, 
at an imaging of the brain and then doing more extensive testing called neuropsychological testing is really how the diagnosis is made. But most physicians can do what we call screening tests in the office to say, you know, you should be, there seems to be maybe an early problem here. Let's go send you off to somebody or let's do more of an evaluation. Veronica, you're a caregiver, not just for your mom who has Alzheimer's, but also your grandmother. When did this journey begin for you? When did you first notice that something wasn't quite right with your mom? The interesting thing is that I was actually living in Chicago when I realized there was a problem and I was coming home and my mother was kind of struggling at work on things that she had been able to do in the past. And she was taking care of my grandmother who had Alzheimer's at the time and and still has Alzheimer's. They were losing weight, finances around the house and paying bills and things like that. I kind of was picking up that something might be wrong. And it kind of all came to a head when my grandmother ended up in the hospital because she had gotten aggressive with my mom and had a seizure. I came home at that point and really everything kind of just came together to say, okay, I kind of need to step in and do something to help. And you left Chicago. You just started a new chapter in your life by coming here to be a caregiver. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, I'm originally from Dallas, so it was coming home, but it's definitely a lifestyle change. I was a marketing executive in Chicago. I was single, kind of doing my own thing. And now I'm here and I have two people that I'm taking care of. So it's a very different lifestyle, but we're making it work. How has the Alzheimer's Association helped you deal with your mom and your grandmother's diagnosis? The Alzheimer's Association has been great. I actually started off as a volunteer there because I wasn't working. And so I was like, you know, you need to get out the house, you need to do something. So I just walked in one day and said, you know, do y'all need any help? And so started volunteering and started learning more about the disease and started getting resources as far as agencies in the community who are here to help. We go to a caregiver support group that I learned about through the Alzheimer's Association. And that's something that I really recommend to people because when you're around other people who are going through the same thing, you can learn so much. And Dr. Kerwin, as a geriatric specialist and someone who treats people with Alzheimer's, you're not just treating the patient, you're treating the caregiver as well and trying to make sure that the caregiver takes care of themselves as well as the patient. Absolutely. That's a really good point that I realized early on when I started doing this was that, you know, I really had two patients um, in front of me, but it's really a team more. It's, it's the three of us are a team or really the whole family is a team. If something happens to the caregiver, the whole system does fall apart. So it's really important to have those systems in place. And the caregiver, oftentimes in the office, I'm writing prescriptions for the caregivers that do 24 hours a day, seven days a week and won't take a break. And I say, well, if I were paying you, I wouldn't be able to work you that hard. And I'm not paying you, so I can't work you that hard either. And I'll write prescriptions for them to take a break four hours a week, eight hours a week to go off, get someone just to stay with their loved one so they can go do something and just relax and and rejuvenate. And the Alzheimer's Association can help with that because if you reach out to the Alzheimer's Association, they have respite care for the caregivers so that someone can come in four or four hours a day or something like that during the week so that you can get away and kind of walk it off, as I like to say. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What have been the challenges for you as a caregiver? Oh, um, let's see. Where do I start? Um, yeah, <laughs> I think the biggest challenge is you're thrown into caregiving and you know nothing about it. I mean, I don't have any kids. I've never taken care of anyone but myself. So not only are you taking care of someone, but you're taking care of someone with cognitive challenges and how to deal with those and figuring out the best way to communicate. You're also an advocate for that person from a medical standpoint and going to the doctor with them and talking to their doctors. My mother, her first neurologist, I wasn't really satisfied with the treatment that we were getting. And so I had to start the process of researching other doctors. And a lot of people don't realize you don't have to stay with the same doctor. If you don't like your doctor, start looking for another one. I know so much about medication now that I did not know before from all types of neurological medicine and just pain medicine and things that I didn't know before. I'm just, I'm learning a lot. I'm soaking it all up. And and I'm really passionate about helping others to to learn as well and, and sharing that information with others. When you become a caregiver, you become an expert 
mm-hmm. on whatever disease that they have been diagnosed mm-hmm. with. And you, and you mentioned dealing with the challenges of somebody with cognitive difficulties. Mm-hmm. And when dealing with someone with Alzheimer's, you can lose your patients, mm-hmm. but that's okay because we're only human. Mm-hmm. But through the Alzheimer's Association and reaching out, by the way, they have this helpline that during my mom's illness, the 24-7 helpline was so beneficial to me just to cry on the line with somebody. Mm -hmm. 1-800-272-3900. That's 1-800-272-3900. Providing information and support to anyone who needs assistance, but also going to the website and checking out the Caregiver Center with tips on dealing with someone with Alzheimer's or dementia. What advice do you have for, for someone who is dealing with somebody with Alzheimer's who has temper issues Mm -hmm. or who can be aggressive? Dr. Kerwin. Sure. That, and that is really challenging. Yeah, you, my mom bit me and pulled my hair. Oh, <laughs> and it's so hard to not take it personally. You have to realize that it's the disease and not that person that's doing that. And the disease is really taking control of them. I think you brought up earlier about the redirect, redirect, redirect as much as you can. But with the aggression agitation, oftentimes that is something that medically we have to step in on just for safety reasons and for quality of life. Oftentimes, I have had some patients with Alzheimer's that when they get agitated and aggressive, they end they remember it. They get very upset that they were like that or that that it happened. Sometimes they're not aware of it. But either way, there are medications that we can use that can help to sort of calm down that edge and that agitation that happens. It's very frustrating to not remember. It's very frustrating to look at this person that's trying to help you or you don't really know what they're trying to do and you just get angry with them because you don't really quite know what's going on. So it's it's a very big challenge. This is really an important part to get more help and assistance from people. Um, this is where having more than one person taking care of them can be helpful because you can often step back, make sure that you're rested and rejuvenated so that when they do get agitated, you can either step away or you can help them de-escalate and really kind of redirect and get a little bit more calmed down. That was the best advice that I ever received was the redirect. Because with my mom, she could get so agitated because she wanted to to go home to Monterey, Mexico. And here she was in Dallas with me. And she was like, I need to go home. I need to go home. And I would redirect her. And, and I would tell her, oh, well, we called my grandmother, who had passed away already. But we called her, and she was at the supermarket. But we're going to see her tomorrow. And that seemed to calm her down. Or if she would get agitated about not being able to remember something, that I would start singing a song that she really loved. And then she'd start singing a song with me. That's and great. that got her mind off of what she did. I also want to talk about not just redirecting, but also not bringing them into our world, Mm -hmm. but staying in their world and their reality. My guest once again for this segment of the program, Dr. Diana Kerwin, an Alzheimer's Association board member and chief of geriatrics at Texas Health Resources Presbyterian. She is the founder of Texas Alzheimer's and Memory Disorders. Also in studio, Veronica Shanklin. Veronica is a caregiver for her mother and her grandmother as well. It is estimated that every 67 seconds, someone in the United States develops Alzheimer's. And coming up on Saturday, September 26th, It's the Walk to End Alzheimer's. There will be one in Dallas at the American Airlines Center, but also in Frisco and Denton that day. You can find a walk near you by going to alz.org backslash walk and then just type in your zip code. There are going to be walks this month and also next month. Now, for me, as I mentioned earlier, this is very, very personal because I lost my mom to Alzheimer's. And like Veronica, I was my mother's caregiver before she died, so I know only too well the challenges that caregivers face. But the Alzheimer's Association was there for me, and I know that they can be there for you if you receive that diagnosis. And the reason I want to find a cure is that I don't want to have to go through what my mother went through, and I also don't want other families to have to go through what I and Veronica Shanklin have been through. So let's talk about not bringing someone with Alzheimer's into our world, Dr. Kerwin and Veronica. This is an important point. I know, Veronica, you're going to have a lot to say about this. Um, What I try to tell people, and this is hard, is just like any other disease state, like if you're diabetic, you can't eat sugar. If you have heart failure, you have to exercise and watch your salt intake. With Alzheimer's disease and dementia, you have to accommodate the disease, not try to make the disease accommodate you. And that includes our surroundings, safety, and the people around us. Don't try to constantly argue with them and bring them into the point and make them remember that they have Alzheimer's. I have many, many families that come into the office just to have an appointment for me to tell them that they have Alzheimer's disease and make sure they know it before they leave so they remember when they get home. 
and they're not really quite getting it, that we have to adjust to this in order to really keep quality of life for that person and to take care of them with dignity as much as possible. How important was it for you to learn that lesson, that you don't bring them into our world, but you go into theirs? I think one thing that I've read and that I keep with me is that you will never win an argument with an Alzheimer's, a person with Alzheimer's. <laughs> it's very true. So you save yourself a lot of frustration and stress and you save them a lot of frustration and stress when you remember that and don't get into an argument. So to that point, if they say something that is not necessarily true, as long as it's not hurting anything, as long as it's not a harm to them, it's okay to go along with it. The other day I was helping my grandmother out the bed and she was like, you know, you men sure are nice. Okay, I guess I'll be a boy or a man today. And then later I'm a pretty little girl. So, you know, you just have to, like you said, go into their world. And if it's not hurting anything, then let it go. And staying in the moment like right. you did with her. Stay in the moment. At that yeah. moment you were you were a boy. But mm-hmm. if you stay in the moment with them, it can really help you all experience a little bit better. I, um, as, a, as a family, you, you learn one day at a time. My sister-in-law, when my f- mom first started forgetting things and she thought that her mother was still alive, my sister-in-law kept telling her, oh, well, don't you remember your mom died? And my mom would get so upset. And she'd like, well, why didn't anybody tell me? And I'd go, don't do that. Just go into her world and go, oh, yeah, we're going to call her a little later, but she was out or she went to go visit someone. And she was fine with that. Yes. Right. Another thing I remember is this too shall pass. Yes. Oh, yeah. No day will ever be the same. So maybe you had a bad day today, you know, hey, let's try it again tomorrow. And I think kind of keeping that positive attitude helps everyone involved. Let's talk about the upcoming walk to end Alzheimer's because this is so important for research. And also, I call it the largest support group in North Texas. So the walk is coming up Saturday, September 26th. There's going to be walks in Dallas, Frisco, and also Denton. You can find out more at alz.org backslash walk. What can someone expect from the walk, Dr. Kerwin? Well, the walk, we've set a high goal. So we need lots of walkers. If you haven't set up a walk team yet, please do so. We're raising money still. You can go on to the website and donate. You can uh, join a walk team or you can form one of your own. We oftentimes see it's it's a, a big mix of mostly family caregivers, but also caregivers from some of the memory care, assisted livings and nursing homes in the area. A lot of advocates, just people that have been touched by it are there. Um, there's lots of great festivities. There's food and music and dancing and fun and camaraderie. Um, there's just a lot of wonderful things. Our goal this year is $1.9 million to raise to go towards research and also to local support services for people that are dealing with Alzheimer's disease here in Texas but also to support research funding for research around the world that's looking for the cures and for the treatments for Alzheimer's disease. And Veronica, you will have a team. Absolutely. What do you want people to know and why it's so important to you? Something that's really important to me and is fundraising and research. I was able to attend the Alzheimer's Advocacy Forum in D.C. this year, and it's where advocates from all over the country come together and we go to Capitol Hill to talk to our representatives about how important it is to increase funding for Alzheimer's research. And one way to increase funding is this walk and raising funds through this walk. So, yes, I have a team. I am raising funds. I'm excited. It's always a fun day. I highly recommend everyone else get involved. It's it's a And I'm really passionate about this disease because the numbers are just they're Every crazy. Every 67 yeah. seconds. Someone is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And my thing is, you know, in 30 or 40 years, if we don't do something, I mean, half of our population will have Alzheimer's disease. And that's just crazy to me. So I feel like we really need to get on this right now and try to do what we can right now to make sure that doesn't happen in the future. ALZ.org slash walk. If you want to join the walk, start a team, or if you want to donate and be part of Veronica Shanklin's team. Team the Golden Girls. Team Golden I love it. <laughs> I love it. And I like that on the website, Dr. Kerwin, ALZ.org, One of the things that it says is if you have a brain, you are at risk. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, and the risk is for everybody. People that have family history, we know that there's a risk for them, but there's also many cases of people where they don't have a family history, and we haven't determined yet what... The, what causes Alzheimer's disease in those people. But the numbers are telling us that as you get older, you know, the risk is there with every year over age 65. Women are affected more than men. We are seeing now that women account for about two-thirds of all the cases. Is that which because was, of our hormones? It's possible. There was, you know, we, we used to know that women were a slightly increased risk. When I was teaching years ago, we would say, oh, it's about 0.5 greater than men. But now we're finding two-thirds of all cases, and so part of it could be a hormone-related issue. 
part of it is longevity and living longer, but there's some other piece that we don't know, and that's where the research funding and the science really comes in. We have to have research funding in order to do the studies to say, what is the gender difference and why would women be at more risk? Because that may help us find the next treatment. If we can figure out what those risk factors are, we can either help people prevent it or delay the onset, which is going to be a huge public health issue for us um, and really helping the next generations. Yeah, because the population is getting older and older and older. And so we're going to see more people instead of every 67 seconds, it could be every 60 seconds that someone develops this disease. So the mission of the Alzheimer's Association is to eliminate Alzheimer's disease through the advancement of research. How is research coming along? Research has really um, received some big boosts in funding a lot because of like Veronica going to the public forum, um, public policy forum of pushing legislators to say, you know, ask the scientists what they need in order to move this along to find the cures like we did in cancer research and heart disease research. And they've told Congress what we've needed, and that money is starting to be allocated in some of the grants or some of the funds from the government. That is really important. We need um, to double to triple the budget right now in research for Alzheimer's disease to really push it along. The good news is um, there are probably over 100 different treatments right now that are in different phases of study for um, either preclinical, what we call before they go into humans or human trials, that do look promising. There's several coming along, but we still have a ways to go. There likely will be some breakthroughs and some treatments that become available over the next few years, and that's wonderful, but we probably will need a bit more, maybe another 10 to 20 years of really pushing this along with lots of research funding for us to really get to where this disease is contained, it's early prevention, early diagnosis, and then control so that people don't lose their memories. Veronica, we have such busy lives with our jobs and with our responsibilities. And I don't know about you, but anytime that I forget something, I start getting worried. You know what's funny? Anytime I remember something, <laughs> I get excited. <laughs> <I'm> like, <laughs> so you I've, flipped it. Right. I've flipped, flipped it. it. I'm like, I remember exactly where I put such and such <laughs> three weeks ago. It's right here under this piece of paper. And I'm like, OK, I'm OK. I'm OK. <laughs> you know, like. So, you know, and it's interesting because I have a mother with a diagnosis, a grandmother with a diagnosis. My mother's father also passed away from Alzheimer's. And people ask, are you afraid that you're going to get it? And I tell them, I can't really live my life like that. I kind of live for the moment and live for today and make sure that what if I do get it, whatever time I had before that, I did my best to live the best life that I could. So I kind of try to stay positive on that note. It's a possibility, but it's also a possibility that that person walking down the street might get it, you know? And that's why research is so important, so we can figure out who might get it, who might not, how to keep them from getting it, you know, and all those things. So nobody knows. I don't know. It's not, and I can't walk around living my life worried about that. Dr. Kerwin, I find like here at work, I have to have a list of things that I need to get Mm -hmm. done during the day, and I do it at home as well. Should I be concerned? I mean, I I do have the family history, but I find that there are so many things and so many distractions with working with a computer and somebody coming into the office and saying, hey, I need you to do this. And then I redirect my attention to that. And then I forget what I was doing before. Should I be concerned? Well, I mean, it would be normal. It's absolutely normal to be concerned, especially when it's in your family. But one of the things that we've been trying to get information out to the public through the Your Brain Matters program, which is one of the new initiatives with Alzheimer's Association, is what can you do to take care of your brain? Like we all think about our heart health and exercise and things, but what can we do to help our brain? And oftentimes it is a lot of the same things that we tell people, which is exercise and eat right, you know, staying organized, relaxation, meditation. But there are things that you can do that even if there's a risk, even if you may develop it in 20 years or what have you, we do know the research is showing us that if you start to take care of your brain now, you can likely start pushing that needle out so that the memory loss may not occur as at young, as at young of an age. So you can start to push it yourself. And that's what we're trying to get more research on and more information to individuals is take care of your brain. You could maybe delay its onset by a few years if you do that. I don't like doing Sudoku, Sudoku or whatever <laughs> it's called or crossword. How can I exercise my brain? So you don't have to do crossword puzzles. You do an activity that's challenging mentally, but that you really enjoy. For people that are musical, we tell them definitely learn a new piece of music or do more music. Music for anybody actually is a really good cognitive exercise. Socialization, going out to a new group and meeting people is a very good way to exercise your brain. 
Make sure you remember everyone's name as you meet them and repeat it. Just kind of do those things that actually that is a mental exercise and it works just as well as a crossword puzzle. We know that people that stay more socially engaged have less of a risk and it's probably because they do keep their neurons connected just by having that constant interaction, language, um, and basically emotional connection with people. ALZ.org is the website for the Alzheimer's Association. And once again, we invite you all to join us September 26th. That's a Saturday at the American Airlines Center for the Dallas Walk to End Alzheimer's. If you live in Collin County, there's going to be one in Frisco that day. If you live in Denton County, there's going to be one in Denton. And then, of course, there's some other walks here in our area taking place in October. Find out more at ALZ.org slash walk. We're raising funds so that we can find a cure. It's the Walk to End Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's. And by all means, if you receive a diagnosis, if somebody that you love receives a diagnosis, reach out to the Alzheimer's Association. As Veronica said, they are an amazing support group. The most important message that you want to get across, Veronica. I think something that I that I wanted to touch on that I didn't is early diagnosis. I think one of the the reasons that we are doing okay with my mother is because I got her to a doctor. We got an early diagnosis, and I'm able to put things in place now. Because you paid attention to those signs. Right. I'm able to put things in place now. It's also compassion. I'm, you know, I'm much more compassionate and patient with her because I know she has a problem as opposed to getting frustrated, you know, when you don't know what the problem is. Then I think it's because we have this early diagnosis. So if you think that your loved one might have a problem, I know it's a scary thing to do. I know there's that fear element, but trust me, you're much better off finding out and being able to deal with it now than having something happen and having to be on the defense because you didn't know there was a problem. So that's something that I really want to encourage people to do, to to go to your doctor to find out if there is a problem. And it could be something else. Don't ignore it. Yeah. Right. Don't ignore it. It could be something else. It could be not even Alzheimer's or dementia. It could be something else. Yeah, so. medications that yeah. they're on or something else. All types of things. So, Dr. Kerwin, the most important message you want to get across. I want to echo what Veronica said is really do um, – Bring your concerns, talk to your doctor about it. Not all physicians feel comfortable doing memory evaluations or making the diagnosis. It's a tough diagnosis to make and a tough diagnosis to give, but it is important for people to know what is affecting their memory. So if your physician doesn't feel comfortable, but there are ways that they can just refer you out to a specialist to get the testing done, um, get the get the full evaluation to tell you what might be causing your memory loss earlier, the better. And then you can get, um, like Veronica said, the unknown sometimes is worse than the known. Although I, I still, it's difficult to, when I give people the diagnosis, at least we know what we're dealing with now and we know what we can talk about and we can focus our energies on what to do to help that person. And the steps to take. And, and also know that you're not alone, that you don't Absolutely. have to walk this journey by yourself, that there are organizations, the Alzheimer's Association, and there are people going through the same thing that can definitely help you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Dr. Kerwin and Veronica, thank you both so much. Thank, thank you, you, Anna. Before we wrap up this morning, Lara Colazzo with St. Jude Children's Research Hospital joins me to talk about the upcoming St. Jude Walk Run to End Childhood Cancer. September is Pediatric Cancer Awareness Month, so not only does this event, which is coming up Saturday, September 19th, raise awareness about pediatric cancers, but it also raises funds for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Lara, thank you so much for joining me this morning. Thank you for having me. So the Walk Run to End Childhood Cancer is coming up Saturday. September 19th, as I mentioned. Tell me about the event. Where is it going to be held? Who can participate? What's going on? Well, thank you. This is an amazing event that we're bringing to Dallas. It is going to be at the American Airlines Center in AT&T Plaza. That's where all of the main events will happen. And then the walk run will start there, and then it'll go through the design district, which will be great. It's very scenic and colorful, which is wonderful. We invite parents, families, communities, organizations, companies to get involved, form a team, get people to walk and raise money for the hospital. It's very important. We'll have great activities for kids of all ages that day. So how does the money raised help children here in the DFW area? So the money raised supports the families that are sent to St. Jude. No family ever receives a bill from St. Jude for treatment, travel, housing, or food. And that's when a family gets sent from anywhere in the world, not just the DFW area. But here in the DFW area, because St. Jude Children's Research Hospital freely shares all of our research and findings, that means all of the local hospitals benefit from all of the research and treatments that are created at St. Jude in Memphis, Tennessee. And because of that, not all children have to go to Memphis, Tennessee for treatment at St. Jude Hospital. Typically, when a family receives the devastating news that their child has cancer, the doctors will then consult and figure out what the best treatment plan is. 
Sometimes that best treatment is to actually send the child to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital because they're, underdo- they're doing a study there where the child can actually fit into what's going on for research. If, if what they've been diagnosed with, there is already a treatment plan in place, they'll be able to access treatment plans created at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital to use locally in their local hospitals. And then if there are any issues that the doctors run into, they'll be able to consult back with the doctors at St. Jude in Memphis, Tennessee, to figure out a better course of treatment for that child being treated locally. And the fact that by going to St. Jude and the money that you guys raise at events like the upcoming Walk Run to End Childhood Cancer, those families don't have to worry about the finances. That can be put on the back burner. All they have to worry about is their child. Correct. Any child being sent to the hospital never has to worry about receiving a bill. Is there a child advocate on hand, someone that can help them navigate the system once they get to the hospital in Memphis? Yes. Once they step foot on the campus in Memphis, Tennessee, they will actually be taken through the process. From the minute they step out of the taxi or the transport that has been prearranged, they are welcomed with open arms, given a hug, and that child receives their treatment within 24 hours of arriving there, if not sooner. Many families that get sent to St. Jude within 12 hours are already at the hospital getting their treatments because we know we don't want another minute or hour to pass because that means it it could be the child's life. So many people know St. Jude Children's Research Hospital because of the commercials that feature Jennifer Aniston and, of course, the founder, Danny Thomas's daughter, Marlo Thomas. She continues his mission at St. Jude. But what do you want people here in North Texas to know about St. Jude Children's Research Hospital and what goes on there every day to help children? Her Marlo is amazing with what she does and all the celebrities that get involved and lend their name to the hospital are amazing advocates for us. But the one thing I would say about the hospital itself is that it's a place of hope. The minute you walk through the doors, it's happiness and you see the kids laughing and their families having a good time. We don't want it to be doom and gloom. We want them to see you could still be a kid, though you're going through this tough time in your life. At the hospital, we have classrooms. They never miss prom. They never miss homecoming. We honor the siblings with sibling day. We make it as exciting as possible. Halloween, I want to go there. Because (laughs) every department comes out and they have a theme and they're out there with the kids with candy and healthy treats. And it's just a great place to be. Every time I get to go... You can't be sad there. And when you walk into your typical hospital, you don't want to go. But when you go to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, you get excited because you know you're going to be seeing something amazing. Even though you know what those families are going through, you still feel that hope. Yes, you definitely do. And walking through the hallways, you know, give them a high five. Ask them how they're doing. They love that. They love the interaction because you have to realize that they're separated from their families. So if somebody's giving them a smile or just showing concern for them, a perfect stranger, they, they know that they're in a good place. So many families receive a diagnosis every day that their child has cancer. The walk run that's coming up on Saturday, September 19th at the American Airlines Center, the whole goal is to end childhood cancer. Do you feel like the research at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital is going to have that dream become a reality? It is. Since St. Jude opens its doors, the the survival rate of cancer in general was 20 percent. They've pushed that to over 80 percent. And right now we're on our way to 100 percent. So our goal at the end of the day is to make sure no child ever dies of cancer. And one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that the research that goes into the pediatric cancers also affects the adult cancers, which a lot of the adult cancers we can attribute to either lifestyle or the environment. But with pediatric cancer, we still have no clue what causes pediatric cancer, gene mutations, family history, whatever. So that's why research is key. It definitely is. And the more we can do at the hospital, the more the local community does benefit from it. For those families who have been impacted because they have a child with pediatric cancer or because they know a child that has been diagnosed with a pediatric cancer, how can they get involved in the upcoming walk run to end childhood cancer? Well, they could just simply join a team, start a team. All they have to do is go to stjude.org slash walk run, find Dallas, Texas on September 19th and click to register. It's as easy as that. I have my own team for my own personal reasons to support my mother's survival from cancer. Join my team. I'm more than happy to people. Join Sandy's Army. We're all about that. So everybody's welcome. And I 
I hope everybody will fundraise for the kids because it's important. Every dollar helps save a life. This is personal for you. Can you share your story? So my mother, Sandy, she's still with us, thank God. Um, so she was having troubles. She thought it was back pain, sciatic nerve problems. Nobody knew what was going on until they took an x-ray and they saw a mass sitting on her spine, spinal column, causing all this pressure. She went to all these specialists. Nobody knew what to do. Nobody knew what it was until finally a surgeon at Sloan Kettering in New York City said, she needs to come and see me. So she went. She had tests done. They determined it was a very rare form of cancer. But to remove the cancer, they had to amputate my mother's leg. But she's great. She's well. She's all, all good. And she's here with us today. And she's moving to Texas. So I couldn't be happier. <laughs> and these are tears of joy. So <laughs> they saved my mother's life, which which means the world to me. So, But she wants to make sure no child ever goes through what she wants to. So that's why we formed the team and she supports it. And she'll be out there with her scooter riding around on walk day. So uh, it, it's a happy time. So she's paying it forward. She is paying it forward. She feels so blessed, but she wants to make sure because, I mean, as an adult, we kind of understand what's going on when there's that sort of diagnosis. But for a child and then for a parent, you don't want to see your child going through that. Correct. Imagine being you know, a little three-year-old and being diagnosed with an extremely rare cancer and then your child and then your parents learn that they're going to have to lose their leg to the point where they'll never actually be able to have like a prosthetic and ever walk. So that's what my mom went through. But when we were faced with that, it was like, lose your life or have your life. And we voted have your life and just figure it all out. And she's adapted and she goes, she travels the world and she does everything. She flies and she shares, you know, everything that's been going on with her. And like I said, the doctors, she just had a recent visit. There's no signs of the cancer anywhere. So well, I'll tell you what, Lara, a lot of people great. are going to want to join lucky. Sandy's team right now. So if they want to join Sandy's team, go to the website. Go Saint- to, yep. Go to the website, stjude.org slash walk run, find Dallas and do a team search for Sandy's army and come and join me on walk day. I'd love to have <laughs> you as a member. And I know your mom would love that as well, because the more funds we raise, the closer we get to winning that battle. It's the walk run to end childhood cancer benefiting St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. And it's coming up Saturday, September 19th. Lara Colasso, thank you so much for sharing your mom's story and for sharing all this information about the upcoming walk run to end childhood cancer. Thank you. And we hope to see everybody there.